Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to cover carbohydrate metabolism part two. So if you remember last time in part one, we talked about glycolysis. Today we're going to focus on understanding the formation of acetyl-CoA and its role as a starting material for the citric acid cycle. We're also going to talk about the electron transport chain and of course oxidative phosphorylation. But to kind of remind ourselves of the overall picture of cellular respiration, let's go through a couple of big picture ideas about all three steps of cellular respiration. We know the harvesting of energy from glucose by cellular respiration is a cumulative function of three metabolic stages, and they are one, glycolysis, two, the citric acid cycle, and three, oxidative phosphorylation. Now, usually biochemists, they refer the term uh, cellular respiration for stages two and three, but today I'm going to talk about cellular respiration um, as it consists of all three of these steps. Now, glycolysis and pyruvate oxidation followed by the citric acid cycle are the catabolic pathways that are going to break down glucose and other organic fuels. All right, so these two steps are catabolic pathways. Glycolysis, glycolysis occurs in the cytosol, if you remember, and it begins the degradation process by breaking glucose down into two molecules of pyruvate. Now, in eukaryotes, pyruvate is going to go into the mitochondria and it's going to be oxidized to a compound called acetyl-CoA. And it's acetyl-CoA that is the starting material for the citric acid cycle. All right, and it, there in the citric acid cycle, the breakdown of glucose to carbon dioxide is completed. And so essentially, carbon dioxide is produced by respiration represents, and it represents the fragments of oxidized organic molecules. All right, now, some of the steps of glycolysis and the citric acid cycle are redox reactions in which dehydrogenases, right, these are enzymes, will transfer electrons from substrates to NAD+, forming NADH. And in that last step of cellular respiration, the electron transport chain accepts electrons, usually through NADH, uh, from the breakdown products of those first two stages, and then it passes these electrons from one complex to another, from one protein or molecule to another, and at the end of the chain, the electrons are going to be combined with molecular oxygen and hydrogen atoms to form water, and the energy that's released at each of these steps is stored in the mitochondria, and it's going to be used to make ATP from ADP. All right, and it's this mode of ATP synthesis that's called oxidative phosphorylation because it's pretty much powered by the redox reactions of the electron transport chain. Now, that's a summary of cellular respiration in a few minutes. We're going to really explore the details of everything discussed here. So it's kind of, it's okay if it doesn't make sense right now, right? Because we've really only covered glycolysis up to this point. What we're going to really focus in on here in this review and in this um, chapter is citric acid cycle and the details of that. And then of course, oxidative phosphorylation, electron transport chain, and the, and the details of that. So let's begin this chapter. And before we actually get it too ahead of ourselves um, and start the citric acid cycle, we really want to talk about the details of how we go from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, right? Pyruvate is the final product of glycolysis, and acetyl-CoA is the starting material for the citric acid cycle. And we need to, we, we briefly covered this in the last chapter where we said, oh, well, pyruvate dehydrogenase is going to convert our pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. But we want to get just a little more detailed here. All right. And so let's talk about it. All right. Last time, what we said was that pyruvate from aerobic glycolysis is going to enter the mitochondria where it's going to be converted, where it may be converted to acetyl-CoA for entry into the citric acid cycle if ATP is needed, 
All right, we said that pyruvate dehydrogenase refers to a complex of enzymes that are gonna convert pyruvate to acetyl-CoA and that it is stimulated by insulin. But we don't know how that actually works. We said, hey, glucose to pyruvate, that's glycolysis, and then pyruvate to acetyl-CoA is um, kind of catalyzed by pyruvate dehydrogenase, and then that acetyl-CoA can be the starting material for the citric acid cycle if ATP is low and needed. Now we want to talk about what exactly that entails in regards to step-by-step. -step. How does this actually work? Well, to do that, let's set this up, right? Acetyl-CoA, and actually we can see a structure of acetyl-CoA right here. Acetyl-CoA, it contains a high energy theoester bond right here, right? That's a theoester bond, that carbonyl attached to a sulfur, all right? Um, and this high energy theoester bond, it can be used to drive other reactions when hydrolysis occurs. So it can be formed from pyruvate via pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, which we said is an enzyme complex, specifically a five enzyme complex in the mitochondrial matrix that forms acetyl-CoA and NADH. All right, now the way that that goes is, well, we have pyruvate, that is the end product of glycolysis. I'm sorry that I keep repeating these details. I just think repetition will help you remember this. All right, pyruvate dehydrogenase is going to come in. All right, it's going to act on pyruvate, which is the end product of glycolysis. Pyruvate dehydrogenase, what it does is it oxidizes pyruvate, creating carbon dioxide. All right, so pyruvate dehydrogenase oxidizes pyruvate, we get carbon dioxide, creating carbon dioxide, and in that process, it requires thiamine pyrophosphate and magnesium. All right, so that's the first step. All right, we've oxidized pyruvate, we've created carbon dioxide in the process, we've needed pyruvate dehydrogenase and thiamine pyrophosphate and magnesium. All right, now, all right, as a second step, we'll need an enzyme called dihydrolipyl transacetylase. All right, written right here. This is going to oxidize the remaining two carbon molecule using lipoic acid, all right? And it's going to transfer the resulting acetyl group to CoA, all right? And that is gonna form acetyl-CoA, all right? So this dihydrolipyl transacetylase enzyme, it oxidizes the remaining two carbon molecule using lipoic acid and it transfers the resulting acetyl group to CoA forming acetyl-CoA. Now, as something, as a, as a I, I guess, quote-unquote side reaction that happens, all right, we have dihydrolipyl dehydrogenase that uses FAD, all right, to reoxidize lipoic acid, all right, and form FADH2, which you see right here. Now, this FADH2, it can later transfer electrons to NAD plus to form NADH that can feed into the electron transport chain later down the line. All right, fantastic. Um, a couple of quick notes here. Um, pyruvate dehydrogenase um, kinase actually phosphorylates pyruvate dehydrogenase when ATP or acetyl-CoA levels are high, and that's gonna turn this reaction off. Pyruvate dehydrogenase phosphatase is gonna dephosphorylate pyruvate dehydrogenase when ADP levels are high, turning this process on. All right, so what you can think about is here's your on and off switch, on, off for this reaction, right? You have this on and off switch that can turn this reaction on or this process off, right? It can say, yes, please convert pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, or it can stop this reaction. All right, the on switch, the on switch is pyruvate 
dehydrogenase, phosphatase, phosphatase. And the off switch is pyruvate dehydrogenase. I'm just going to not rewrite that. Kinase, that's the off switch here. All right, so that's our on and off switch for this reaction. Now, one quick note is that acetyl-CoA can also be formed from fatty acids. Essentially, what happens here, this is less common, um, fatty acids can couple with CoA um, and in the cytosol to form like a fatty acyl CoA, which then will move to the intermembrane space. Um, and there, the acyl group is transferred to carnitine to form acyl carnitine, which can actually cross the inner membrane. And then that acyl group, acyl group, I'm sorry, is transferred to mitochondrial CoA to reform a fatty acyl, acyl CoA that can then undergo oxidation to form acyl CoA. Um, but that's just, an, uh, just a quick side note, I suppose. All right, so that is how that works. All right. So again, one quick summary of all this, right? The takeaway points, if we will, all right? Upon entering the mitochondria through active transport, pyruvate is first com com converted to a compound called acetyl-CoA, and this is carried out by a multi-enzyme complex called pyruvate dehydrogenase, all right? And the following things happen, all right? Pyruvate gets oxidized, all right? That carboxyl group is removed from pyruvate, releasing carbon dioxide. It gets oxidized. Also, at the same time, we have NAD plus uh, is reduced to NADH. And then lastly, an acetyl group is transferred to coenzyme A, resulting in acetyl-CoA. And that is going to be the starting material for the citric acid cycle. The acetyl-CoA starts the citric acid cycle. All right, and so that means we can move into talking about the citric acid cycle, which functions, by the way, as a metabolic furnace, uh, if you will, that oxidizes organic fuel derived from pyruvate. Now, one quick note, all right, maybe I haven't made this clear enough. Glycolysis, glycolysis, all right, we start with one molecule of glucose, all right, we end up with two molecules of pyruvate. All right, both of these molecules of pyruvate get, you know, converted to acetyl-CoA. So now we have two molecules of acetyl-CoA, which means we're going to cover acet the citric acid cycle, right? And it's going to happen twice for one molecule of glucose because one molecule of glucose results in two molecules of pyruvate, which results in two molecules of acetyl-CoA. All right, and the cycle, the citric acid cycle right here, it shows what happens to one molecule of acetyl-CoA, and it happens twice. So whatever, whatever we're forming here in acetyl-CoA that we talk about, remember that's for one molecule of acetyl-CoA, and there's two total acetyl-CoA molecules from one glucose molecule. All right, so just keep that in mind. Don't forget that. That's important because that could be an easy trick question. What is the net total of high energy molecules in the citric acid cycle? And you may forget, you may be like, okay, well, there's one NADH molecule that's formed at step three, step four, uh, one ATP at step five, and one FADH2 at step six, and this other NADH at step eight. So that's a total of three NADHs, blah, blah, blah. Don't forget to multiply it by two, right? Because there's two acetyl-CoA molecules. Cool. Now that, now that that is out of the way, all right, let's go over the steps of the citric acid cycle. We're going to do this in, 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 a, in a different way. I'm going to go over this once, talking about how one molecule gets converted to another, all right, and then we're going to go through it again, and we're going to talk about the enzymes that are functioning at each one of these steps to help us convert one molecule into another. All right, and this way we get to cover the citric acid cycle twice. All right, and that way, hopefully, that repetition helps this information stick. Okay, so starting from the top, we have our acetyl CoA that acts as a starting material. All right, acetyl CoA. Um, 
adds its two carbon acetyl group to this molecule right here, oxaloacetate, all right, producing citrate. So these two molecules, acetyl CoA and oxaloacetate, are starting materials, all right, add together in a way to produce citrate, all right? So that's our first step. Acetyl CoA adds its two carbon acetyl group to oxaloacetate, producing citrate. Cool. Citrate is then converted to its isomer, isocitrate, by removal of one water and the addition of another. All right, so that's step two. In step three, isocitrate is oxidized. All right, it's oxidized to form alpha ketoglutarate. And in the process, it reduces NAD plus to NADH. All right, so that's our first NADH molecule. All right, then this resulting compound, alpha ketoglutarate, loses a carbon dioxide molecule to form succinyl CoA. In this process, again, all right, um, the resulting compound is oxidized, and so NAD plus is reduced to NADH. Okay, now this resulting molecule, succinyl CoA, all right, is then attached to, uh, is then uh, goes through a conversion to become succinate. All right, now here, CoA is displaced by a phosphate group, which is transferred to GDP to form GTP, all right, which is a molecule that functions very similar to ATP, and actually GTP can also be used to generate ATP, all right? So step four was alpha ketoglutarate to succinyl CoA, and then succinyl CoA, we, we, CoA is displaced by a phosphate group to form succinate, all right? And then here, what happens is two hydrogens are transferred to FAD to form FADH2, and, that, and, and succinate gets oxidized to fumarate, all right? So that's step six. Step seven here is that the addition of water rearranges bonds in this substrate to form malate from fumarate. So that's step seven, we formed malate. And then last but not least, this malate is oxidized to regenerate oxaloacetate. And in the process, NAD plus is reduced to NADH. Okay, fantastic. So that was our first go around of the citric acid cycle. We're gonna do another go around. And in this process, I'm gonna remind you that the citric acid cycle takes place where? In the mitochondrial matrix. Its main purpose is to oxidize carbons, uh, to, to oxidize carbons and in intermediates to carbon dioxide and then generate high energy electron carriers like NADH and FADH2 as well as GTP. All right, now we're gonna cover this, this citric acid cycle again, making note, all right, of the enzymes that help catalyze each of these steps. So I'm gonna erase all this, and we're gonna go over it once more. All righty. Erase, 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 sorry. Brief hold while I erase all of this. All right, let's start from the top. All right, we have acetyl-CoA, all right, acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate. Like we said before, acetyl-CoA adds its two-carbon acetyl group to oxaloacetate, producing citrate. What is the enzyme that helps, you know, move forward this first reaction? At step one, we have citrate synthase. All right, it couples acetyl-CoA to oxaloacetate and then hy hydrolyzes the resulting product to form citrate and also, as you see, CoA-SH. All right, this enzyme is, is regulated by negative feedback from ATP, NADH, and, and citrate. All right, so now we formed citrate thanks to the help of citrate synthase. All right, then step two is moving from citrate to isocitrate. What helps us in this step? Well, at this step, we have enzyme called aso, uh, 
uh, acetonitase. I think that's how you pronounce it. Pronounce it. It isomerizes citrate to isocitrate. All right. So that's step two. What about step three here? All right. At step three, we have an enzyme called isocitrate dehydrogenase. All right. It oxidizes and decarboxylates isocitrate to form alpha ketoglutarate. All right, this enzyme generates the first carbon dioxide molecule, all right, and the first NADH molecule. That is so important to remember. This third step here, all right, we get our first CO2 molecule, we get our first NADH molecule. This step is also the rate limiting step all right that's very important to know all right this can be a, this can easily be a question on your exam all right the rate limiting step is this one it is heavily regulated all right so atp and nadh are going to be inhibitors whereas adp and nad plus are going to be activators all right so what that means is a lot of atp and nadh be, being present are going to inhibit the citric acid cycle, are going to be inhibitors for the continuation of the citric acid cycle, whereas high ADP and NAD plus are activators, they will signal the citric acid cycle to proceed, if you will. All right, so that's the third step. What about the fourth step? At the fourth step, we have an enzyme called alpha, alpha keto glutarate dehydrogenase complex dehydrogenase complex it acts really similar to the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex what it does is it metabolizes alpha glutarate to form succinyl coa all right and this ends th this step generates the second carbon dioxide and the second nadh molecule of this cycle all right Fantastic. That's step four for us. Then at step five, we have an enzyme called succinyl CoA synthetase. All right. What does this enzyme do? It hydrolyzes, it hydrolyzes the theoester bond in succinyl CoA to form succinate and CoA SH. All right. This enzyme also generates, you guessed it, one GTP molecule. All right, one GTP molecule. Fantastic, that's step five. At step six, we have succinate, all right, succinate dehydrogenase. All right, succinate dehydrogenase oxidizes succinate to fumarate. All right, this flavoprotein is actually anchored to the inner mitochondrial membrane because it requires FAD, which is reduced to form one FADH2 molecule, which is generated in this cycle. So this is the step where you get FADH2. Then at step seven, all right, at step seven, we have fumarase. All right, this enzyme hydrolyzes the alkene bond right here, a fumarate forming malate, all right? This requires, um, right, so it hydrolyzes, so it requires input of water, all right? And then at step eight, we have malate dehydrogenase, dehydrogenase, which oxidizes malate to oxaloacetate, and this enzyme generates the third and final NADH of this cycle all right now remember this happens twice because there's two acetyl coa molecules that we form from the two pyruvates that we form from glycolysis from one glucose molecule all right so there we have it that's the citric acid cycle all right now i'm going to stop here all right and in the next video we'll spend some time talking about the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation for now this is it. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day.